Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Martin, who, besides being a total babe and a pan uh, aficionado, is a final year PhD at the University of Washington. And with that, I will let you get on with it. Thanks. Um, I'm happy and excited to be here. Um, I have, in fact, been baking a lot during quarantine. <laughs> um, and today I'm going to be talking about social and ethical considerations in English toxic language detection. Um, and yeah, feel free to interrupt me for clarification questions during the talk. I'll try to monitor the chat. And um, I do have some discussion points at the end. So feel free to wait if you have like bigger issues you want to raise. So um, I'll just jump right in. Basically, this talk is going to be about bias in language. Um, and so I do want to warn people that this is potentially going to be some upsetting or offensive content. Um, and also just to frame it a little bit, I know there might be people on here that are um, you know, coming from different uh, places in the world, but here we're gonna use the Western social cultural perspective um, when talking about biases and social biases specifically. So there's a problem of online uh, toxic language that we I'm sure are all aware of. Um, and it particularly targets minorities, unfortunately, this toxic language. People tend to attack you know, black people or transgender people or other people with um, you know, minoritized status. And there's increasing pressure both from just civil rights groups, but also from um, you know, uh, legislature for um, these big corporations or these online platforms to actually moderate or do something about this toxic language. And um, the problem that's specific to um, you know, today's internet is that the scale of this toxicity is actually really large. And so you can't really you know, just have humans look through everything and decide whether something is problematic or not. And, and in the cases of, so specifically in the case of Facebook and Twitter, that's not very possible. In the case of Reddit, it's only possible if you sort of set up this like hierarchical community specific moderation setting, but that can still lead to, you know, hate endorsing communities. So then you have to delete the entire community. So there's this sort of problem anyways. And, um, you know, an alternative is to start using automated flagging. You could either use it as a pre-screening tool before human moderation, which a lot of companies are doing, but then you could also use it as the only tool for content removal, which doesn't raise any issues at all, you know, because a robot judge, what could go wrong? Um, so that, you know, this latter point has given the rise to uh, the field of automatic hate speech detection. And its goal is to try and make the internet less toxic. And as we know, it's a growing field in NLP. Um, and, you know, it's even started, there's a workshop that started three to four years ago that used to be called uh, something different, but now it's called the Workshop on Online Abuse and Harm. And there's even, um, you know, companies are developing automatic tools or APIs that you can use in your website to uh, filter out comments. But there's actually some problems with hate speech detection today. And, um, you know, part of it comes to the fact that this task is often cast as a yes, no question, which actually suffers from uh, subjectivity in the answers, uh, both because the annotator agreement is kind of only moderate if you don't train your annotators properly, and also because um, what you perceive as offensive or toxic can actually depend based on your identity and your perception of, um, you know, hate speech and free speech and stuff like that. Then additionally, there's also been documented biases showing that um, if you're if your um, text contains an, a minority identity mention, it might um, get flagged as toxic, even though it's not actually toxic, like he's a gay man. And also as I'll talk about soon, um, there's also biases against racial minorities. Um, specifically, models tend to pick up on, um, on African-American English and sort of think that that's um, a indicator of offensiveness. And so to dig more into that, um, I'm going to talk about some work called uh, the risk of racial bias and hate speech detection, which um, we presented at ACL and got an outstanding paper nomination, but also wanted to say that um, this was also rejected from the prior conference before then, um, showcasing again how great the reviewing system could be. Um, so the problem that uh, we're tackling here is that there's severe racial bias in hate speech detection, and I'm not talking about the kind of bias where um, you know, which people are hating on certain types of minority groups. Instead, I'm talking about the bias that uh, will lead an inoffensive tweet such as this one to be flagged as offensive when it's written by an African American user, but not when it's written by a white English user. And part of that comes from the fact that these models are trained on text only annotations without any context of um, who the speaker was. 
Um, so you could imagine the, the model not knowing if you know who the person is um, seeing the n-word could lead the model to think that it's an offensive statement. And so the underlying issue is here that the data sets are ignoring the social dynamics in which the speech is occurring, such as the identity of the speaker or the dialect of English. And um, ignoring these nuances here actually risks harming minority populations by censoring inoffensive speech online potentially. And so in this part of the paper, we, or in this paper, we characterized and quantified the racial bias in hate speech detection. And specifically what we wanted to look at is both do machine learning models acquire this racial bias from data sets, but also can annotation task designs affect these racial biases. And um, as I mentioned, there are a bunch of different biases that um, the literature has looked at or you know, shown these models to have. So why are we focusing only on racial bias? Well, you know, as I mentioned, minority populations are more often targeted by hate speech and racial bias has been less studied than other identity-based biases. Specifically, there's a lot of work on gender biases in NLP. And then particularly on Twitter, there's a silence of, um, there's a, sorry, there's a danger of silencing black folks disproportionately. Um, in this day and age, you can imagine that Twitter is a really important space to organize, um, you know, Black Lives Matter movements, um, you know, in light of the protests happening in the United States right now. So this is an important space. And so if you tag African-American speech, you're actually hindering people's rights to, pro to protest, for example. However, there's a challenge here, and that's that Twitter profiles don't actually have race associated with them. So it's not trivial to just study this problem. So instead, what we did in this work is we used dialect as a proxy for racial identity, where we sort of operate under the premise, the sociolinguistics premise of um, the fact that there might be specific lexical indicators of uh, minority identity. Specifically, we're gonna use the African-American English dialect, which is common, but not limited to black or African-American folks in the US. Um, and it is a valid variety of English that's been extensively studied by linguists. Um, and it's been shown to also have variants on Twitter. And specifically, we're gonna use this lexical detector by Blodgett et al to infer whether a tweet uh, could be an AAE or not, given it's kind of a probability. And again, I should note the caveat that, you know, dialect and race are both much more complex than just a probability. So how racially biased are these data sets actually? Um, so we looked at two different data sets in our paper. Um, and in, you know, the first one, um, they have a label called offensiveness. And here we see that 92% of tweets written by uh, black users or associated with black users are uh, labeled as offensive versus only half of the tweets um, associated with white users. And we see similar discrepancy in our second data set where um, you know, they have a label of abusiveness of tweets where it's 60% for um, African-American English versus only 18% for white aligned English. So um, you might be wondering like, how does this model, how do models operate under these bias data sets? Do they acquire these uh, racial biases? And the answer is yes, they acquire them, but they also exacerbate them. Um, specifically to showcase that, we trained and tested two different classifiers, one on each of our two data sets. And we looked at their behavior and specifically we looked at their rates of false flagging of toxicity uh, on a held out set broken down by dialect group, so white or AAE. And um, the rationale here is that if your uh, false positive rates are really different, then they're, um, you know, you're violating this equality of opportunity criterion um, and basically your model is uh, biased. And so what we see here is that, you know, these models are uh, biased because they have really uh, high discrepancy in their false uh, flagging rates of toxicity. Specifically, in the first model trained on, um, you know, the first data set, 46% of non-offensive AAE tweets get mistaken for offensive, but only 9% of white tweets get mistaken for offensive. Um, and a similar discrepancy happens in our second data set. So this is showing that predictions by both classifiers are really biased against AAE tweets and flag them as uh, toxic more often. So because these, bias, these data sets are biased, you might be hoping that it won't actually generalize beyond these data sets. Unfortunately, it kind of does. And the way that we showed this is um, we wanted to simulate the situation uh, in which classifiers are released into the world. And um, you know, we just wanted to see what the prediction rates would be of toxicity of these classifiers. And so we used one data set where we had dialect inferred based on geolocation of the tweet and um, cross-reference that with like US census data to see what the demographics of where this tweet came from was. Um, and what we see here is that the um, tweets that are you know, inferred to be written in African-American English are almost, or are more than twice as likely to be flagged as toxic than the tweets written in, uh, you know, or thought to be written in white English. 
And then we wanted to look, maybe dialect is too limiting or too noisy. So we wanted to look at uh, when you actually have race that is self-reported by Twitter users. So we have this data set where they gave us, um, or they gave Priyotok Pietro, um, the people gave their t tweet handles and also um, their, their entire, uh, their race and their demographics. Um, so we can actually predict on that data, data set how much toxicity the classifiers think there is. And again, we see a similar discrepancy where tweets by black users are written, are, are flagged more as um, toxic than tweets by white users. And if you use the second classifier, you see the same exact trend where, um, you know, tweets by um, tweets in African-American English and tweets by black folks will be more often flagged as toxic. And this is evidence basically that the racial bias generalizes to other corpora that aren't, you know, labeled specifically for hate speech. So you might be wondering, okay, this is really sad. What can we actually do to reduce these biases? And one answer is that you could change the data collection a little bit and give it a little bit more context. And so in order to test this out, we ran an experiment where we took 358 AAE tweets and asked mechanical Turkers to label them again for offensiveness, but we did it in three different settings. Um, in the first setting, we just, you know, gave them the text only tweet, no other context. And um, because of the way we sampled the tweets, about 55% uh, ended up being labeled as, pos as uh, offensive to anyone. Then we provided information about the dialect of the tweet. So, as inferred by our dialect detector. And we said, oh, we think this tweet is written in African-American English. And we see that the um, likelihood of annotators labeling this tweet as offensive decreases by 11%. And we see a similar thing when we say, oh, this tweet might be written by a, a Black or African-American person. Um, so this is interesting to show, but then we also wanted to see whether maybe even the phrasing of the question made a difference. So we also asked uh, workers, is this tweet offensive to you as opposed to, to anyone? And here, what we see is that if you um, add the dialect or the race, only the race actually makes a difference in terms of whether people are offended themselves. And, and when I say it makes a difference, I mean significantly makes a difference. Um, but what this shows is that not only does priming annotators about the dialect or race of the tweet actually influence their labeling behavior, but also just it is another example of these annotations being highly um, subjective and just the wording of the question actually makes a big difference. So, you know, to wrap this part up a little bit, overt toxicity definitely backfires against minority, overt toxicity detection, sorry, um, backfires against minority. And, um, you know, specifically we show that there's dialect based racial bias in data sets. And this is likely due as noted by Celia Blaja in her ACL 2020 paper that this is very much due to the negative perception of AAE in the sort of broader English speaking world. Um, so this is sort of like sociolinguistic racism going on probably. Uh, and this bias will propagate downstream through machine learning models. Um, and this also shows that, you know, awareness of identities is important. Um, specifically it, through our pilot study, we showed that highlighting the black identity influences the labels of offensiveness, um, which kind of raises the question of, okay, well, what can we do with our hate speech data sets if they're all that, this bias? Um, so I wanted to briefly talk a little bit about some work in progress um, with a colleague of mine, Shuhui, and you know, uh, other colleagues at UW. Um, and so, yeah, this is very much work in progress um, that I was definitely writing up until uh, before the start of this meeting. Um, but the idea here is that we wanna see if we can filter the data sets or maybe de-bias the models um, by still using our existing hate speech detection data sets. And this is inspired by um, the fact that, well, you know, a lot of NLP benchmarks have led to these big pre-trained language models to reach seemingly superhuman performance. But then when you've, people have looked at them a little bit more closely, they're actually exploiting spurious correlations in data set, in data sets. And so um, this has actually um, created a lot of NLP solutions in terms of both fixing the data sets to make them harder. So fix the bench, fixing the benchmark so that uh, we're not getting this superhuman performance anymore, but also making sure that the models are robust so that they actually generalize out of data sets into more um, maybe adversarial settings or, or things like that. Um, and so the question that we wanna ask here is, can we actually use these debiasing techniques for toxic language data sets or toxic language detection models? Um, and what we're looking at here in terms of um, hate speech detection or toxic language detection uh, biases is, first of all, the uh, minority identity mentions bias um, that I mentioned, which causes, you know, more or higher false flagging of toxicity to happen. 
but also just this sort of lexical dependency um, on swear words. Models actually sort of overly rely on the presence of a swear word to predict whether something is toxic or not. And so we can argue about whether this sentence, I fucking love this, is actually toxic or not, but it's much less toxic than other things that contain the same swear word in it. And then the finally, we're also gonna look at racial bias um, because it's a, it's a arguably more societally important one too. Um, and so we're gonna use the, um, the second data set that I talked about earlier, which comes from Fanta et al 2018. And we sort of binarize the labels in this. Um, and just to show you how biased these data sets are compared or with respect to these three biases, um, there's this inequality rate that you can compute using um, metric from Dixon et al, which um, you know, doesn't make much sense out of context, but um, basically the higher this inequality rate, the more um, reliant on a minority identity mentions uh, the data set labeling um, is. Then there's actually a really strong correlation between toxicity and swear words, which is you know, not super surprising given that oftentimes swear words actually carry toxicity. Um, and then to reiterate in a different number, the racial bias, there's a, a pretty strong correlation of um, probability of AE with toxicity in this data set. So um, the types of debiasing that we're gonna look at is both a bias aware modeling technique and a bias agnostic data set filtering technique. Um, in terms of the bias aware, we're gonna look at sort of the, I think it's the state of the art model or uh, you know, debiasing of models uh, technique that uses an ensemble method. Um, and the way that, wor that it works is basically you train two models jointly using an ensemble. And one of the models will only have bias features as its input. So for example, does the tweet contain um, an identity mention or not? And then um, the all, like, all features, including the bias feature will be put in the other model. And then essentially at training time, you let it, you know, train itself. And then at the end, you end up with a biased model and an unbiased model. And then you can sort of discard the biased model to only use the unbiased model at test time. Um, and then in terms of the data set filtering, we're gonna use this technique called adversarial filtering, specifically the light variant of it, um, where essentially what you do is you just take a, um, you just take the data set and then you use a pre-trained model um, to compute representations over your entire training data. And then you train a logistic regression classifier to basically weed out iter iteratively, you weed out all the easy examples and you get a set of less biased or maybe, or you know, harder examples that aren't as, um, that don't contain as many spurious correlations basically. And so what we did there, um, or what we're doing, what we're doing now, I guess, um, is, uh, we wanted to, for the, the model side, we wanted to uh, run three experiments, one per bias, because it, you know, we want to see specifically how, um, how the biases affect the models. And we had three uh, adversarial test sets that basically are um, sort of more robust to these um, biases and the labels don't correlate as much with um, the, the presence of these, of these biases in there. Um, one that is like templates from the identity mentions uh, paper um, one that's like a um, sort of machine in the loop data collection system where they basically ask Turkers to fool the classifier and say something toxic, but that the classifier would detect as toxic, uh, which as you can imagine, really decreased the number of swear words that were used. Um, and then we're gonna use the data from our uh, racial priming experiment that we did in our uh, racial bias paper as sort of the quote unquote less biased um, racial uh, data. And what we see is that um, comparing, sorry, comparing on the right, comparing the naive versus the ensemble debias only uh, part of the model, um, the green bars are higher than the um, than the gray bars for the identity and swear words, which indicate that these um, you know these types of biases can actually be sort of removed from the models. However, there's um, not really a difference, or even you're not. Uh, you're doing a little bit worse using an ensemble debiased model for the racial bias. Um, so it seems like maybe that bias is harder to remove from models. However, the caveat here is that, um, you know, the quality of the adversarial data might be a factor specifically. It might be also harder to create an actually adversarial test set for this racial bias problem. So taking uh, the other direction where we just want to look at if we can filter the data, um, 
we're going to run AF light um, and keep only the 50% hardest or less biased data points in this data. And then we're going to first, you know, because this is a data filtering method, you can actually look at um, the biases intrinsically in your data set and see if they decrease. Um, and we see that across all three rows, which are, oh, sorry, all three columns, which are the, um, the three types of biases, the numbers uh, or the bias ratio or the correlation uh, decreases when you use AF light compared to just randomly sampling 50% of your data. So that's a good sign in indicating that, you know, the model or the AF light is actually throwing away um, data that is very uh, reliant on these spurious correlations. Um, but then when we look at the same setting that we did with the ensemble model, um, we see that um, it might not make a difference at all. And if, if, uh, if anything, it's actually not really working. So if you train a model on your, um, your filtered data, it's not going to be as, as, um, as unbiased as we want them to do. So what this shows is that, yeah, intrinsically, AF light actually does reduce the bias in the data set, but that doesn't actually prevent the models that you train on them to um, be less biased. And in fact, it seems like that's not the case at all. Um, and so to sort of finish up with, with uh, that part, we also wanted to see what if you um, run the same experiment as we did in the racial bias paper and predict sort of like the in the wild experiment of, of predicting um, toxicity without having actual labels of toxicity. And so we are again going to use the um, tweets with the self-reported race from uh, Pietro. Pietro. Um, and what we see again is that all models still disproportionately label tweets by black folks as toxic, as you can see between um, the dark red bars and the light pink bars here. So basically this is showing that models will just like at higher rates flag tweets by black people as toxic, even if you sort of like, you know, debias the data set that it was trained on or, um, you know, try to debias the model inherently as well. Um, as I noted, I think that um, the racial bias one was the hardest one to get rid of, quote unquote. So this is not very surprising. Um, yeah. So takeaways from this is that different biases will affect data sets and models differently. And the purely lexical ones might actually be easier to deal with, like swear words or identity mentions. Um, but the sociolinguistic you know, nuances are still not really captured or you know, removed in, in uh, that setting. Specifically, the bias that is uh, racial and you know dialect based is still there, um, and this also raises the question of like, you know, what about slurs in these like in this category of swear words? Like, how are slurs doing, or how is in-group language like the word queer? Like, how does that play into this? Um, so maybe we should like rethink a little bit and take a step back and like think about how we're operationalizing toxicity, and if our goal is to detoxify the internet you know, current methods right now are doing decently well at selecting something like we should kill all gays and saying that, whoa, this is really toxic. But there's also another type of subtle way that bias can be manifested. Like, and we shouldn't lower our standards just to hire more women. And we can all kind of understand that this is really problematic because it implies that women candidates are less qualified than men. Yet um, these existing tools are not really able to capture this. Um, and so I wanted to briefly mention uh, social bias frames, which is work that I presented at ACL 2020, um, which is all about reasoning about social and power implications in language. And the motivation was really this, um, this statement of like, we shouldn't lower our standards just to hire more women or this category of statements, um, which we all know implies this problematic uh, sort of stereotype that women are less qualified than men, but um, tools f fail to flag. And so social bias frames here is a new structured formalism to distill knowledge about the bias implications of language beyond just, or no matter how overt or subtle it is. Specifically, what a social bias frame looks like is we're gonna ask whether it is offensive or not. We're gonna ask whether it's um, intended to be offensive or not. Um, then we're gonna ask, is this you know, lewd or sexual? And then if it is offensive, we're gonna ask, is this offensive to just an individual or is this also offensive or carry implications about a group of people? And then um, if yes, what is that group here? It's women. And what is the implied statement behind it? It's that women are less qualified than men. And finally, we're gonna ask, do you think this might be a, a, an, an instance of in-group speech where um, someone is saying something uh, about a group that they're a part of as well? And here it doesn't really seem to be the case. So um, the motivation for this work was that um, there's you know, shades of nuances of the way social dynamics and social inequality can be portrayed in language. 
Um, and bi binary offensiveness classification doesn't really suffice in this case, and it risks backfiring against minorities, as I've shown. There's also a lot of subjectivity in annotations. Um, but the sort of second you know, key uh, motivation for this is that a lot of these come without explanations. And so explanations in specifically in this case might actually be really crucial to understand, you know, why, what, uh, why your model might be flagged or um, make you, you know, educate you on what, what, why what you're saying is problematic. And so social bias frames is really, we're trying to come up with a better way to distill these bias implications. And we also released um, the social bias inference corpus to enable some neural modeling on top of that. Um, so just briefly, this work is um, related to a variety of different, um, you know, existing works. Specifically, it is kind of like a frame formalism, except more in line with the connotation frame style um, frames. It is more about, you know, understanding what isn't written or the connotational meaning as opposed to the more denotational, like what is actually in the sentence, which uh, FrameNet and PropBank tend to focus on. Then it's also kind of related because of this sort of implied statement to um, this whole work on, uh, on common sense inference. Um, however, you know, unlike more concept net sort of physical taxonomical knowledge, it's more like atomic in that it models more social dynamics and social common sense. And then because we release an inference corpus or just, you know, a labeled corpus, this is obviously very related to toxicity detection resources, but it is more structured in the annotations compared to the more binary or, uh, you know, categorical variables that are in the existing uh, resources. And then also compared to recent work on detecting condescension or microaggressions, our work tries to cover both overt and subtle biases. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we included each of these variables in there, um, mostly because I spent a long time uh, looking over research on rudeness and offense and, and sort of all this stuff, but also because um, I think it's, um, yeah, I think, I think that's sort of the key contribution of our work. So the reason why we included lewdness, as you can imagine, is that um, sex is a very specific but distinct way that a post can be biased. Like people talk about explicit and sort of stuff. And uh, we wanted to be able to capture that as a way um, to sort of differentiate from other types of social biases that could happen. Um, we also wanted to capture whether something was uh, you know, perceived to be intended to be offensive or not, because not only can intent change how um, offensive you think something is, but also um, if you give feedback to someone or you give an explanation, it might actually be really crucial to call them in and say, hey, we realize that you might not have intended to say something offensive, but here's what the actual statement uh, implies. So that's a variable that we thought was really important. Um, then when we asked whether something is offensive, we wanted to sort of have the highest recall. So we use the, term, um, the terminology of offensive to anyone. This um, group or individual is sort of uh, straightforward. You just want to distinguish, is this just an insult or is this actually like carrying sort of more so, like so societal biases in it towards a group? Um, and then if, you know, if the, this is targeting a group, which is the, uh, who's the group? Um, and then we also wanted to know if um, statements were self-deprecating or in-group statements because, um, because of my previous work on racial bias, we wanted to know like, oh, is there sort of like an in-group language thing that uh, we're capturing? Um, and then finally, you know, the implied statement was like a short natural language phase. And that's sort of the crux of this work is like that pretext explanation of why something might be offensive or biased. Um, and then as sort of a teaser, if you're interested in this work, um, we also release social bias inference corpus, which uh, has 150, oh sorry, yeah, 150,000 social bias stream tuples annotated from 44,000 different posts from Twitter, Reddit, Gab, Stormfront. Um, and it has basically um, 34,000 implications, about 3,000 different demographic groups. Um, but I won't talk too much about this corpus. Um, if you're interested, you can look at the paper. And then um, we also did some neural experiments, uh, which I'm gonna sort of high level describe for the sake of time. Um, you know, we trained GPT-2 to basically, given a post, predict the social bias frame. And our modeling experiments basically show that because this is kind of a hierarchical frame, um, the, the structure of it kind of, um, you know, is a little bit, makes it a little bit harder. And like, as you get lower in the frame in terms of levels, um, the harder the variables get to predict. And um, this is, you know, both a classification and a generation task. So when we're looking at the generations, it seems like models are not really able to generate the, um, you know, the explanations of 
um, of why something is biased and they, uh, they tend to overlay on surface keywords, which is not surprising in NLP, um, but they're doing a decent job at figuring out which group is being targeted. Um, but again, if uh, you're interested in more of the modeling experiments, please see the, please see the paper. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to sort of talk at a high level about the motivation behind social bias frames and in general about my research. Um, AI systems need to understand the social dynamics of the world in order to navigate or interact with the data that's coming from the social world. Um, and we've seen time and time again that if you don't, you know, understand these dynamics, the backlash of the you know, the actual harm that you're doing is really bad. So like when Google started tagging African-Americans as gorillas in facial recognition software, that's not really good. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if all of y'all remember MS Tay, but that was also kind of a catastrophe. So because these data sets are all trained on, you know, real world data, um, and we know that real world data will reflect societal dynamics, as Robin Lakoff said, so the social discrepancy in the positions of men and women in our society is reflected in linguistic disparities, which extends to all, um, you know, to basically all minorities and all societal dynamics. Uh, these societal dynamics will include social inequality, which makes our, um, you know, social bias in our data basically unavoidable. And so I kind of want to push for um, models that can anticipate the power differentials or what I like to call, or, you know, just, you know, started calling this algorithmic cultural competency. Um, and briefly what this means or what cultural competency means, there's a sort of spectrum um, from cultural destructiveness to cultural proficiency um, where cultural competency is about being able to adapt to diverse situations and acquire cultural knowledge, but be aware of the, you know, the dynamics of difference. So not only being aware of the differences between cultures, but also what these differences imply or how that affects how people interact and also being able to assess one's own culture and beliefs uh, and sort of not recognizing this non-neutral stance that there is. And I think most of NLP today is somewhere between the cultural blindness, sort of like, I think something's English, but I'm not going to say, you know, who's speaking or whatever. Um, and somewhere between cultural, yeah, it, somewhere between cultural blindness and so, uh, cultural pre-competency, I think. Um, so the question that I have for us is how can we achieve this for uh, NLP systems and how can we achieve these four goals that I've listed? Um, and then also sort of at a, you know, going back to the start of my talk on a more practical note, like online toxicity is still an issue that platforms have to deal with. Um, and they're still gonna use AI systems because of the sheer volume that um, is going on. And that, so we know that these problems are still gonna be there of like, you know, they're gonna, have biases in terms of the social, you know, racial biases and other things, but also, you know, the subjectivity of these systems and um, we don't really know what's going on. And they're, you know, they're still gonna risk censoring um, people by deleting non-toxic posts. And so I wanna think about, you know, what are some maybe better approaches that we could have specifically, apparently Twitter beta tested this functionality at some point, but um, what if instead of, you know, deleting things that already exist out there, we sort of helped people edit while they were writing. So this kind of machine in the loop bias detection during writing. Um, maybe when you're um, going in to write something, you're being prompted about, you know, why you're writing this. So that's kind of what Nextdoor did. Um, Nextdoor is this like neighborhood platform where like you can only join this, like it's like, so it's like Facebook, but only for your neighbors. And it's, um, it showed, they showed that um, a lot of like reports about um, like sort of strangers um, roaming the neighborhood were made about black people um, in America. And they sort of addressed this by explicitly, like they knew that this bias was there. And so they basically like changed the way that you could report sort of suspicious activity by asking for like, hey, like you don't wanna be racist by the way, right? So like, you know, make sure that you're like describing like why you think they're biased beyond their race um, or why you think they're, you know, they're lurking or why you think they're, um, they're just, they're you know, suspicious. Um, and I think like around those times, like it's where we need um, both in the machine and loop writing system, but also when you're changing the interface, like that's where we need some more sort of bias specific explanations and sort of, you know, give more than like, oh, this might be toxic, this might not be toxic, really be like, this is carrying this, um, this bad implication basically. But even that has its own, you know, ethical problems potentially. Like what are the ethical implications of, you know, giving someone so many pop-ups when they're trying to write something? Um, and this is kind of a half-baked sort of thing that I wanted to mention, which is that, you know, what are the 
we also have to think about these platforms as companies and like, what are the incentive structures um, for these platforms, right? Like, what are the motivation uh, that these companies have to really make their platforms less biased? Because at the end of the day, hate makes people fight, which means people engage, or, you know, platform engagement and usage. Um, and hate also spreads. So that means like, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna create even more engagement in that way. Um, and sort of as we've seen from, you know, back in the 90s and um, GPS creation or GPS systems in cars, but also recently with like female voice assistants, there's these, all these types of social and cognitive biases that make more money for companies. Like if you, um, apparently people hate or people think that low-pitched voices sound more authoritative. So if you have an AI assistant, that's assistant is supposed to be more like submissive to you. And therefore, if it has a higher pitched voice or a female voice, it'll be more pleasant and a more, you know, a better customer experience, which is again, a very clear like path to um, social, like, you know, per perpetuating um, social inequality between gender, genders. So like the question there becomes maybe like, how can we change these instru incentive structures um, of these online platforms? So this actually leads me to the end of my talk. Um, and I want to thank you for listening. Um, and I wanted to finish with some discussion questions in terms of what I just talked about. If you have any thoughts, please feel free to chime in. Thank you.